One of those things that so many converts to the Catholic faith are, are attracted by, that the non-Catholic Christians looking into the Catholic faith really go, wow, what's going on there, are what we call sacramentals. Things like the sign of the cross, like holy water, like, uh, like, like the rosary, like certain prayers we do throughout the day, these different things. These are like the, the, the bread and butter of the Catholic faith, these devotions. And there are so many of them. And many of us who were non-Catholic Christians who are hungry for more of Christ, to be quite honest, uh, found these kinds of ways of, of being a Christian, these, these ancient ways of following Jesus and worshiping more deeply, and found those things still practiced from the very beginning to today in the Catholic Church. And it's these things that drew many of us into the practice of the Catholic faith. Well, this week on the show, I'm joined by Sean McAfee. He is a convert to the Catholic faith with a story very similar to my own. It's a great one. Tells a bit of it at the beginning of this video. And he's written a book all about sacramentals, what they do, what they're for, especially for the audience of of this show, for, for you guys, for those who want to know more about the Catholic faith. It's a crash course on sacramentals, and it's fantastic. From the rosary to holy water to blessings to prayer positions to devotions, everything's in there. It's an awesome conversation from a guy who knows his stuff. He was a convert once too, attracted to the beautiful faith like I was, like many of you are, by these amazing aspects of the faith. It's a great video, guys. Please enjoy. Please watch. Please subscribe to our channel to help this go and grow week after week. Thank you and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcast, thanks for listening there. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you find it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please leave a rating or review because that helps push the podcast out to new people and gets conversations like this one to a wider audience. So thank you for listening there. And if you're watching on YouTube, hey, thanks for watching. Sorry I use my hands a lot. I got a bunch of comments recently about my hands. I can't control them. They're kind of, they're, they're there. They just, they, they flap around a lot. So Thank you, viewers, for sticking in with the hands and all that. Subscribe to this channel, hit the bell, do all those fun things, guys, and keep it nice in the comments, uh, and thanks for watching. I am joined this week for a fantastic discussion. It's going to be a great one, guys, by Sean McAfee. He is a convert to the Catholic faith, a lay Dominican, the founder and editor of the Epic Pew website, uh, uh, author of a number of fine publications, including um, Out from Tan uh, Press, The Compendium of Sacramentals. This is fantastic. A bunch of other books, awesome. I have a bunch of my shelf here over here, Sean. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and Thanks, hello. man. It's been a while. I've been waiting for my invite. <laughs> oh, man. Just listen, listen. Okay, so I don't know if you remember this. You're, you probably don't remember this because you're a busy guy. You, I, I got one of your books years ago, probably five years ago now or something. Maybe I think it was your first book. Fantastic. I read it. I plan to have you on the show. I think maybe COVID hit, I think was what happened in the meantime. Uh, but you ghosted me. Never, never ended up on the show. Something happened. I don't know. The wires didn't connect, Sean. And uh, didn't get you back then. So this time, this book, I'm like, no, I'm going to have him. He has no choice. Uh, because this is like the the exact book that uh, I think we were all waiting for, Sean. So kudos in this fantastic book. And thanks for thanks for. Oh, my it. gosh. Are you for real before COVID? I ghosted you. No, I, I'm yeah, very sorry. I'll become yeah. your co-host. <laughs> and then you're stuck with me. <laughs> That's fine. I love that. Do you talk, how are the hands? Do you use the hands a lot? Cause the hands yeah, are you are, Italian? Oh, I'm not Italian. No, no, I'm Italian. I'm from. Okay, you know the Italian little... jokes about about yeah. Italians and talking with their hands, like how to get them to quit talking and tie their hands behind their back. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, that that works too. I should try that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah. all good. YouTube's a nasty place sometimes, man. I can deal with a lot of the comments, but the hands thing, I don't know, guys. I'm sorry. I think a lot of us hands. talk with our hands. The yeah. hands, they they just go. Listen, this book is a compendium of sacramentals, and it's awesome. I'm, I'm, I was thinking when the, when I got this book and, and kind of flipped through it and had a look at it, I thought this is exactly the kind of thing that so many of us converts to the Catholic faith, John, were, need and and want because they're. There's so much, and you know this, I'll ask you a minute to tell us a bit about your own conversion story, because it's an interesting one too, but when when those of us who become Catholic, right, there's so much in the church to mine, like to, to dig into. There's so many different kind of devotionals, so many ways to enhance your enhance your faith and live out your faith and, and be Catholic. So many more ways than there ever was as a evangelical 
Protestant, and, but it's it's hard to figure it out sometimes. Like you, you can spend a lifetime, you know, it, it, mining different parts of the Catholic faith, and that's beautiful. This this book gives such a fantastic presentation of the things we do as Catholics in, in clear, there's pictures, it's lovely, they're fantastic jobs. I mean, I, I don't, I, I believe in, in, in being a virtuous Catholic. I don't want to inflate your ego too much, Sean, and cause you to stumble into the center of, center of pride, but this is a fabulous, this is a fabulous book. Like, well knowing, done. Knowing that I ghosted you before COVID, you know, already, already <laughs> deflates my ego, you know, I feel bad. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah. So I've been a uh, I've been a Catholic for eleven years. Um, this Easter will make twelve. So I converted in twenty twelve. I had to think of that before the show, and you asked. Um, it's so funny how long you can do something and then still be learning. And it's like a marriage. You know, I've been married for fifteen yeah. years, and I was just yeah. telling a friend. You know, never be afraid to you know even do counseling or, or have the hard discussions over and over again because things can go by in a whirl and you can yeah, realize yeah, all the yeah, things yeah. that you're missing and need. So no, I, um, <clears throat> I've been Catholic for almost 12 years and, um, it started with a, uh, an aggressive, I guess, a uh, venture into disproving one of my Catholic friends, um, back in <laughs> Omaha. Yeah. I live in new Orleans now, but mm. disproving him. Yeah. So he was a, he's a psychologist. And I mean, this guy could have probably answered questions on the side for Catholic answers. And, um, I asked him one day because because he was he was using terms. It was, he was he's a biblical counselor, and I was having some uh, you know some personal troubles at the time, and um, <clears throat> and he would pull out these uh, you know examples from the Bible, and he would say Saint Mary or the Blessed Virgin, and Saint Paul, and Saint Peter, and I'd be like, you mean you mean Mary, and you mean Paul, and <laughs> yeah, I mean the 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 scriptures don't call them the Blessed Virgin Mary. So what are you doing? And I said, so are you Catholic? And you know, I had a little bit of an education in this kind of thing. Um, and he said, yeah. And I said, and I just kind of wanted to trigger him, I guess. And I said, I, I said, well, should I be a Catholic? And I just wanted to know what he said. And, and his answer really blew me away, uh, even to this day. And it seems so simple, but he said, you know, I, I believe you're a Christian. I believe you love the Lord. Um, um, but you know, there are some differences and, and what those differences are that I would recommend is to say, yes, you should be a Catholic because you don't have all the tools of the faith. You're not, you're not, a, you're not a yeah, worshiping yeah, yeah. God in the fullness of the faith, um, especially through the Eucharist. But, uh, you know, as we talk about the saints, you know, these are the cloud of witnesses we see in um, Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, so, yes, of course you should be Catholic. You should, you should have the complete, um, gospel presented to you in order to live a, a life of sanctification. I was like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> you know, it's just me and the Bible and the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and I and I was a thoughtful, I was a thoughtful Christian, but um, <clears throat> took a lot of issues with what he what he was saying there, you know. And so I had all the stumbling blocks that anybody would, you know, had to discover what the Eucharist was, had to um, understand the Marian dogmas and how he you know, duly and hyperdulia veneration, you know, uh, the ultimate veneration of, of, of Mary uh, above all the saints. And then, of course, the worship of God, the right kind of worship that we adore to him as adoration alone. Um, you know, those are things that I took back to him every other week. Um, and it became so uh, it became so enamored in this subject that I would go to my wife. I, mean, I was pretty much done with the counseling at that point in time. And I was like, Jessica, you got to meet this guy. His name is Sean, too. And um you know, uh, she got kind of tired of it. We were having, she's pregnant with our first <laughs> yeah, son. Yeah. She's pregnant with our first baby and she's, you know, she's nesting. She's preparing yes, to yes, bring a, was, a, a, a life into the world and to expand our family and kind of like not in touch at all. And I, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking about what he's saying all day and, you know, reading Scott Hahn and um, Steve Ray and uh, just a myriad of authors. And uh, she was like, okay, well, you can, you can study all that, but you know, let's, let's also focus on our family and uh, bringing this child into the world. And, and then we'll take care of all of that. Um, so, you know, every week, like I said, I would bring a new topic to this guy, whether it was infant baptism or, you know, even the, um, you know, the perpetual virginity of Mary or just these simple subjects or, or very important subjects about the sacraments um, I would bring to him. And I would read even Protestant history books, um, you know, from like Yale professors or Cambridge. And, uh, and they would talk about Ignatius of Antioch or Tertullian and all these guys corroborated to prove that the Catholic church and very, very legitimate and visible ways was a lot the same as the Catholic church, as far as structure and beliefs, um, within the first century, 
obviously handed on from the apostles. They would have gone that far that quick. Um, and these are people who, you know, Clement knew and Ignatius, or I mean, uh, Ir Irenaeus knew St. John um, the rev rev of the Revelation, um, that St. John. And, you know, Linus and Clement knew St. Peter. And it was just fascinating to me to know all this and to learn that there's a corroboration of these Catholic theological elements in the first and second century. Um, and so, at, at, you know, to kind of sum it up, Keith, is at the end of this study, which took about a year, I, I, I hate to put it this way, but I didn't really want to be a Christian if I couldn't be a Catholic, because I knew it was, at that point, even, even though I hadn't been, um, I hadn't had my baptism, you know, confirmed by a priest or anything, I hadn't had my marriage blessed, hadn't even been, you know, accepted into the church through confirmation, I didn't really want to be a Christian if I couldn't be a Catholic because my <laughs> conscience would be violated. Yeah, and yeah. so, um, yeah, got into RCIA immediately. I was like super late to the boat, right? RCIA <laughs> usually starts in like, I don't know, September. They let me in right after the new year in January in 2012 and became a Catholic at the Easter Mass at, on the Easter Vigil. I think it was like April 12th or something in 2012. And holy smokes, can't believe it's been it's been <laughs> over 10 years now. And <laughs> Still learning tons. You know, I didn't know all about the sacramentals before yeah, I wrote yeah, this book. Yeah. It's just fun to learn and share it. That's awesome. That's and that's funny because well, I had a similar experience. Our first, our, our my wife was pregnant with our first son when I kind of went to her and said, "You look, look, hey, honey, I've been doing research for the last year. I, I, you, I think you maybe came to your wife a little earlier than I did." And, and but here's one. And no, 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 we're having a baby. Like this is this is really awful timing. So right. yeah, and that's, it is yeah. Pretty eventually, pretty eventually pretty I think just like a pregnancy, she nine months later she came in on the first Sunday, yes. Sunday of Advent. Yes, so yes. I'm really glad one. to yeah. have that kind of communion. Yeah. You know, not everybody gets that. Not every convert husband gets that. So, um, thanks be to God for that. The mercy yeah, of the yeah. family. Yes, Amen. And we're we're the exact same way. It, it was it was the, yeah, the exact same uh, situation, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's so okay. So sacramentals, like that's uh, um. So fascinating. Okay, so I don't know what what your perspective was on sacramentals before you became Catholic, but for me, there's kind of two ways of you know I think about this. And the first is sacramentals are those weird things that non-Catholic Christians look at us as Catholics and kind of go, like, "What are they doing? What are those things they you know? Why are they crossing themselves? Why are they blessing themselves? Why are they, what are these rosaries? What are these other weird things that are happening in Mass? Why are there bells and incense sometimes? And what's what's going on?" And they kind of go like, wow, that's, that's weird and probably super wrong. Like that, like that, yeah. that I, I think actually it was Marcus Gerdai from the journey home. I had him on the show a while ago now. I think, I think it was him that, who said that to the non-Catholic Christian, a really devout Catholic looks like a complete, like idol worshiping pagan. Right, because yeah. if you're the complete package, if you're a devout Catholic, like you're you're doing the rosary, you're doing the kneeling for statues, you're doing like you know you're going to a mass that's going to have the bells and the incense and like you're, but that looks to the outside like these crazy things, right? Yeah. So there's that aspect of sacramentals, and there's the other part of that is the, the those those Christians, those non-Catholic Christians who don't have those things, we believe as Catholics are missing out on a huge part, like kind of like you were, right? With what your your therapist friend said, right? You're missing out on, on a huge part of what it means to have the fullness of the faith that, that, that God gave us in the Catholic Church. So there's those two aspects to it. One is the, the danger, danger. These things are scary. But then we see that and go, no, actually, you're missing out on these things. And I think knowing more about these things, if you learn what they are, what they do, what they're for, like that goes a long way to beginning to bridge that that gap. And that's the thing we do on the show. That this is the whole goal, right? Is to help people understand what we as Catholics are actually doing or believing right. in the, in these things that we do. So this is a fascinating topic to dig into. And I think the best place to start with, because there's those misconceptions, is to ask you what what the sacramental? Like what where do we even begin talking about these these things? The church has, I wouldn't say struggle, but the church has strived for the 2000 years it's been around to really put a good definition on it. Because even as early as the days of uh, the Patristic Fathers or, yeah, or the, yeah, the yeah. early classicals, people were, um, Aquinas actually had to kind of kind of create the word sacram sacramentals. Um, the medieval writers had to kind of copy that suit because they were, diff they were, it was difficult to take the words of like, let's say, um, 
you know, Clement, I mentioned some of the early Christian authors or origin, and they'd be talking about holy water and they would call it a sacrament. But of course they weren't talking about the valid signs of, you know, actual grace being efficated upon a person. So a sacramental, the church has strived to, to put a definition on these. A sacramental is a sacred sign that bears resemblance to the sacraments. And what it what the church wants us to know is that they point us in the direction, they dispose us to receive the sacraments, which do contain the efficacious grace that will sanctify our lives and hopefully one day bring us into the gates of heaven. So that's a lot to unpack, but the basic, the basis of a sacramental is that it points us to a specific feature of sanctification through the sacraments, which are always efficacious. They always work. And sacramentals don't really have that grace impartation. They put us in a position that disposes us and disposes us in order to go and receive that through the sacraments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, I guess, maybe a fundamental kind of misunderstanding or a fundamental difference between a lot of non-Catholic Christian practice and and Catholics. Right? I mean, we have we have a, a priesthood. We believe comes from the thing that the Christ established, right? And the and the priests, in you know, the the, the bishops, right? It's accession from the apostles. This authority is passed down through time. Priests are, you know, are are agents of of the church, right? That have the ability, right, to to help us to worship God in the way that He wants us to worship Him, right? So when we say sacraments, talking about these things that we believe that Christ instituted, right? And and there's roots of this in 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 the Jewish tradition, right? That come down, yes. right? Catholicism is kind of the the fulfillment of that. These these sacraments are that way that God wants us to worship him and how God gives us grace in the ordinary form, right? right? That, that right there is a big difference from say non-Catholic Christianity, right? Like I certainly wouldn't have believed that there's a special way that God gives me grace. I would have gone to, to, to church. I would have prayed. I would have listened to a sermon and believed that I, was, that I was living the Christian life. As Catholics, there's a different way of living, right? There's actually, we can do these things that we believe Christ has prescribed for us that actually help us to become more like him those are right the sacraments does that make sense to lay that kind of framework out yeah exactly sacramentals kind of draw from that right yeah the church calls it ex opere operato for the sacraments and this is kind of nailed down in the book um, really early on because everybody needs to kind of understand exactly what the difference is. You know, we can say right, bears yeah. resemblance. But what does that really mean? So the church says that sacraments always operate ex opere operato, which is fa fancy Latin to say they always work. It's, it's by the virtue of the work produced. So that's sacraments. They always work. And sacramentals, not to say they don't always work, but there's there's more of a – they're more like the road signs that point you to the direction of where sure, you're trying yeah, to get yeah, something yeah. that actually works. If it's trying, I, I don't want to make too many crude, t crude uh, references, but if they get you to the restaurant or they get you to the church <laughs> or get you home, um, these are the signs that do that. And I, and I like talking about our separated brothers and sisters. Um, I mean, before I was a Catholic, I, I wore a cross around my neck. I, I had hung a cross on my wall. My wife even gave me this, you know, image of a dove in a, on a coin, um, within our first two years of marriage, well before we were Catholic, um, that represented, you know, the Holy Spirit. And these are signs that can remind me of these actual spiritual facts oh, and truths. Yeah, yeah. And that is a lot like what the sacraments do. You know, you have the, the three breakdowns of sacramentals, right? You have blessings, which we all really understand. We have uh, um, exorcisms. That's the second category, um, which we can get into just a little bit. I don't go into a ton of it in the book. And then we have, of course, the popular devotions. And those are the signs and the devotions that we either pray and participate in or the physical um, signs of piety, like this crucifix behind me or, you know, a a medal. Oh, I'm not wearing it. I had surgery recently. I'm not wearing it. Um, you know, like a like a miraculous medal around your yeah, neck or yeah, a Saint Benedict yeah. medal that point us in the direction of a specific truth. And what they do is they're supposed to move our hearts. You're supposed to look at a crucifix. You know, even as a Protestant, you can look at a crucifix and say, "My gosh, I mean, look what look what he suffered for me." Yeah. And that can lead you to contrition. It can lead you to sorrow for your sins and and so forth. So we can talk all about the many types of sacramentals are our candles and you mentioned the smells and bells you know the incense and you know sacred bells um and they all are supposed to kind of have a unique way of pointing us back in the direction of sanctification 
Yeah, that that's fantastic. I love that. I mean, and, and and putting it in that in those terms, right? These are things that that, that non-Catholic Christians do too, in large part, right? We, 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 I think the Catholic Church has a longer history of maybe naming some of these things and describing them more. And and there's certainly more ways of exp- of expressing our our faith in tangible ways. But that's because I think in its wisdom, and we see this right from Jesus Himself, in Christ Himself. We we believe instituted the sacraments, which from which sacramentals right come but there are there are a number of of things that christ does that are that are physical things we see physically happening in the new testament i'm thinking even even of the idea of relics like you know saint paul's handkerchief right saint peter's shadow these kind of weird things that that's in the bible right and and the church draws from from those things i mean didn't didn't one day sit down and go oh we should we should take take this handkerchief thing and do so right you know right away right those things kept kept being a thing like it didn't stop it didn't stop being a thing I remember reading once, and I say this in the show a couple of times, that that there's testimony of the very first Christians, once they were catechized into the the Christian faith, would be told the location of St. Peter's tomb, right? And they used to go, they used to go and would would lower uh, scraps of cloth, like handkerchiefs, for example, down in this this hole into where the tomb was to hopefully touch it against the bones of, of Peter, because they believed that had this sacramental connection. It wasn't magical. It didn't magically heal people. I mean, right. it certainly could. God could use it to do that, right? And there are cases of that, of those kind of things happening. But it was that kind of, that, like you say, that, that road sign pointing, like, oh my gosh, I have here in my house this cloth that touched Peter that reminds me of the grace that God gave Peter, that reminds me of the power that God gave Peter in, in the church and, and points back to Christ. Like, that, this has always been a thing. <laughs> the, the, the sacramentals, it it right? definitely has. And like you said, it comes from the, the, the scriptures of the, the Jewish roots, right? In Second Kings, yeah, we read yeah. of Elisha, you know, they, they touch the bones yes. of a dead man yes. and he was brought back to life. I mean, so yeah, so relics, they're not exactly a sacramental, but they're related to sacramentals because they, they we well, first of all, a lot of sacramentals are touched to relics. Um, which be, makes them third-class relics. So if they touch a first-class relic, we can go into the definitions of these. If they touch a first-class relic, they become a third-class relic. And so you can have a lot of sacramentals. I've got some crosses that have been touched to the bone. You know, I think it's like a femur of, uh, of St. Dominic. Very lucky to have these things. Now, I'm not sure exactly what I expected from it, other than for my faith to increase, <laughs> my, my devotion to increase as I wore this or used this or carried this rosary or these crucifixes. Um, crucifici. Um, but right, <laughs> yeah. a little bit, a little bit of Italian. Um, oh. Yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're right on, and it's, it's fascinating. It's exciting. It's exciting, and it's not weird, but it does. There is some, th- some, act, some items to guard against that I talk about in the book. It's not just, you know, what is it and how do you do it. There's a lot in this book that I point to about, you know, how do we treat these things when we're talking to other Catholics or non-Catholics yeah, about yeah. them? How do we defend the use of them, or even just. Um, not not give up so, such an erroneous smell um, to our separated brothers and sisters whenever we're, we're using these, like wearing a rosary, you know, for fashion, or putting one on your wall for decoration, or hanging one from your mm. rearview mirror. Like, where do we draw the line between superstition and religious practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, like you say, I mean, knowing and understanding why we do these things and what they mean and what they point back to—that's such an important thing, right? About uh, explaining the faith, right, to those who are who are inquiring. I can think of myself, so many people that I encountered in, say, in high school, university, who were quote unquote Catholic, who say, wait, wear a rosary, right? Or have it on their on their da- on their rear view mirror or have Catholic things hanging around. Well, if you ask them, well, what's what's that for? What, what do you use? I don't know what it does. It, it hangs there because that's what I was told to do. And I, I, I do that, right? And that's, that's a, a kind of a poor witness. To somebody who's who's asking questions about the faith, who's really inquiring and wants to know, right? So I, it's important, I think, to know kind of the roots of why we're doing these things, if we're going to really do them. Well, first of all, do them effectively, right? Uh, make use of them appropriately, and for the the, the watching world. I think is increasingly going to become curious with these these wacky Catholics as the world 
continues to kind of spiral away from religion altogether, right. like yeah. to know how to explain, okay, you, yeah, you know what? I do this because this is what I think it does. And this is what this is how it helps me in my faith kind of thing. That, that explaining thing, yeah. I think, is going to be really important. And I do is. have an appreciation for the wisdom there. And thanks be to God, my wife pointed out to me, because I kind of, not to say I called her out, but I noticed that she had a like a rosary hanging from her rear view mirror in the in the family van she's like oh no that's actually a rear view like decoration that i bought at a religious store it's not like a full rosary it kind of resembles a rosary with you know some sort of metal and some beads and then a crucifix but this isn't like you know a rosary that i could be praying and then don't this is kind of like an ornamental decoration that could serve as like <laughs> the same purpose like you know just one of those visual yeah, reminders yeah. um but yeah, you know, there, there is, it, there's a difference between like wearing then I, and I mentioned like wearing them for fashion or putting them on your wall for decoration. Like either of those things could be done with absolute excellence. Should you actually have the devotion to those items or, you know, be willing to defend and explain and, and show the hope for the reason that is in you, you know, the first Peter uh, yeah, 15, yeah. you know, 315 kind of practice. Um, those can be wonderful examples of the faith and, of course, the, you know, your personal devotion to them. I mean, I don't see a lot of difference in wearing a, 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 wearing a rosary so long as you use it and wearing a medal so long as you believe in it too so um kind of kind of a difference there but um yeah uh, catholics are known for getting into these little pitfalls that can uh, make it look a little superstitious you know the, sure. the rosary hanging from my wife's van is not going to protect us from accidents um, but it definitely will um, bring to mind the the blessings and the oh, yeah. um, safety that we're oh, praying yeah. for as we yeah. do venture out into the world. <laughs> yes, yes, and I, I I I hung one for a long time because it helped me to stay honest when I'm driving. So I can't I can't tailgate and honk at the person in front of me if there's a rosary hanging there. Yeah, you might like, not hey, call you know them what? that I name. Actually, yeah, I actually need to like behave myself and act appropriately. <laughs> it was a fantastic reminder to live my faith out. Like I'm. I got that, you know, the Jesus fish in the back of the van does a similar thing. Like I, I if I'm cutting a guy off and that's what the last thing he sees, well, that's not very witness to my, to my Christian faith. I like that, the Jesus yeah. fish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to, I want to start maybe the, in the meat of things with the sacramental, the, the gestures, because there's so, there are so many just interesting things we do with our body, like gestures we make at mass when we pray. I mean, that, that alone could probably be a, a full book treatment here. I think digging into those kind of things we do, those Catholic calisthenics, right? Like at mass. Yeah. But yep. those, the, there, there's so much in all of those gestures, right? And I, I think having kids brings that home for you, right? When you are teaching your kids what these things mean, you really got, first of all, you realize how many things there are to teach them about different yes. gestures we do, the kneeling, the bowing, genuflecting, right? The, the crossing yourself, all these things. And then it's like, you know what? They, they are so important. Like, all these things serve a certain purpose. And I don't think, I'm sure you'll, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I think many who experience Catholicism for the for the first time, begin to live out their faith, meet older, more mature Catholics who go, oh, I didn't know that's what we, sure. why we did why we did that. I just right. always grew up you know, kneeling and bowing and genuflecting without really understanding why that was happening. Or don't know that they're supposed to be doing something at a certain time because our culture has kind of maybe lost that uh, that reverence or that kind of understanding of why it's important to do those things. Yeah, nobody's. And you told come in as a, a new convert yeah. and go like, "Hey, well, no one's bowing here. What's go what, what's going on? Or, no one's doing this." But these gestures are, I mean, they're, they're amazing. They're beautiful. They're they're rich and, and and they're ancient, right? Yeah, yeah. So where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, so the gestures are like one of the most important parts that you said, you know, talking about children, I'm thinking of my son, Dominic, you know, I constantly have to remind him, you know, a good genuflection is on the right knee. Yeah. Um, but really, it's a matter of, you know, showing reverence to the tabernacle, yeah. Yeah. of course, and that's really what we're doing. And it may look definitely hocus pocus, it can look like, oh, my gosh, why are you showing worship to a, a man made idol? You know, why are you breaking the first commandment here? You know, you're pe people might not even realize you're doing it to the altar or to the tabernacle, but you know, you could bow in front of a, a you know, a, a, sta a crucifix or a statue of Mary or something like that and be completely justified in what you do, but it can look the wrong way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah having those understandings, but really, even if they don't understand, you know, just even having the inner disposition, because that's what it's all about, is just having the inner disposition to, you know, realize you're not doing it out of, you know, what do they say, going through the motions. 
Yeah. You know, like yeah. making the sign of cross after receiving communion, like that's not a requirement, you know, but bowing in front of communion is um, that kind of thing. You know, it's very, very important for Catholics to, to apprehend and understand these things, not just so they can do them and, you know, kind of check off the scorecard. I had a priest who used to say, you know, God's not a cosmic scorekeeper. <laughs> He's not counting how many times you cross yourself, but it does matter. Yeah. I mean, this is the chief sign of our faith, the sign of the cross. You know, yeah. there's, I think there's like 25 things. I've got an article on Epic View or something somewhere. So it's like 25 things the sign of the cross says when you do it. You know, the incarnation, God coming down, or you know, the procession of the Holy Spirit, you know, through the Father and the Son, yeah. the procession of the Holy Spirit crossing that gap between the Father and the Son, through the love of the of the two, first person, first and second person. Um, things like that are just a reminder of our baptism. Um you know, make wonderful splashes, no pun, no pun intended, no pun included, <laughs> you know, make wonderful impressions on our faith, but also, you know, obviously serve to keep us mindful. And as we're mindful, it's, it's really cyclical, you know, as we're mindful, our faith will grow. And then as our faith will grow through the mercy of God, you know, which is always a gift, you know, our interest in making those good signs of the cross, not just a, you know, quick, I just hit a home run and you've got to do it at Yankee stadium kind of thing, <laughs> making it willfully and, and nice, um, can matter. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. So you're, yeah. Yeah. And it was, I, I can remember my, my very first RCIA class, right. As in looking, becoming a Catholic and we prayed, right. And suddenly the sister leading the class does sign the, and I'm, like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's like, that was the really, the chief, Started? like, <laughs> oh my gosh like we're 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 different like this, these people are different than yeah. like, even like the you know the, the, i mean praying is praying right uh, right but you suddenly realize like wait a minute th this thing this marks us as being different than than all other or many other christians because we do this thing we begin to pray but then you look into it and you realize how ancient this this sign is like you say what a kind of catechesis it is all these things that it symbolizes right yeah. the richness of that the the ancientness of that it's it that simple gesture <laughs> it's truly like, ancient like too said, i mean like, yeah it, it really was like the secret handshake of the first yes. and second century yeah. you know until it be like they wouldn't even from what i understand the sign of the cross wasn't even just like a physical apprehension like they would they would actually kind of with their feet or with their fingers like draw it in the sand Oh, yeah, you know, and then they yeah. became kind of like, you know, they would use their thumb to trace something on their forehead. Now we have, of course, we have like three different ways to make the sign of the cross, you know, the full, yeah, um, we yeah. have the, you know, before the gospel, you know, even yeah. sometimes if I like, I don't know, run a yellow light or see an ambulance, I'll, I'll, I won't make a full <laughs> sign. I'll like, you know, do one of these on my forehead. Um, and then of course, you know, priests and, uh, yes. you know, they, bishops, you know, make the, make the hand gesture, but, um, yeah, those matter and they do impart a special blessing. And that's really where it all kind of comes yeah. from. It's not, it's, I call it a double sacramental. It really is one cause it's the sign of the cross, but even if they're giving a blessing, you know, it, it, it they're calling or invoking the name of Christ, which he has commanded us to do. So yes. That is one of those weird things where I'm like, okay, you know, I, I go to family dinners or something or family Thanksgivings or holidays and nobody else in my extended family is yeah, Catholic. Yeah, same, yeah. My kids will all start, you know, hey, it's family <laughs> meal time. Sean, say those, say, you know, the other religious one of the family and everybody will bow their heads, but we're the only yeah. ones crossing ourselves. And everybody, I could tell yeah. it makes everybody uncomfortable. Like, are yeah, they afraid yeah. they'll like convert all of a sudden or like, <laughs> you know, maybe all the demons will come out or smoke will, you know, come out of the vents or something. I don't know what they're thinking is going to happen, but I mean, this is what Christ has commanded us to do yes, is to pray yes, in his yes, name. And yes. of course it's the name of the entire Trinity. So why would we yeah. not use it? That's so funny to me. I could go off on yeah. a huge tangent there about how <laughs> even as a Protestant, like never prayed in the name Ooh. of the Holy spirit, but why on earth not, yeah, you know? Preach so it, man. preach it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for, it. but you're right. Like this, this. Okay, I mean, this is the first thing you do treat in this book. Is this the we might not get past this first sacramental? But really, yeah, I I agree. It's such a strange thing that why didn't I do this before? This is an ancient prayer right. gesture. Why, why? Like, what was my problem before as evangelical that we thought this was inappropriate to do? And why is it? Why are why are people so allergic to you know? I, we're the same, <laughs> right? We're the same. My my kids will do that. We will do that. And we're the only ones at the, at the table doing that. And because it's, it's wholesomely funny. Catholic, yeah, it's strange, and if you're not, right? it's like it, it's kind of it's. I don't want to compare it to the Eucharist because the Eucharist is, of course, the source and summit of our faith. That's what unites us. But the sign of the cross is 
pretty similar in a way. I know other liturgical denominations, you know, Lutherans. I don't know if about Episcopalians, um, um, Anglicans use it, but not nearly as much. Like in a standard sacrament, like baptism, like 17 signs of the cross will be made. Yeah. Like it is a premier aspect of our faith to <laughs> bless things with the sign of our, you know, with the sign yeah. <laughs> of our faith, you know, what, what was the tool that God chose yeah, yeah, to, to yeah, be yeah. sacrificed as a lamb? Um, it's so cool. Like we could, yeah. we could make a whole episode about it. <laughs> well, that's it's all in the book. Thing. It's all in the book. It is. It's it's all a, the book. It, it is. Well, one more thing on this. I saw the coolest thing we had at potluck with our, a bunch of Catholic families in this group we were a part of the other week. And uh, we had a priest there to, uh, along with us. And he did a, the blessing of, you know, for, before we ate and in the middle of, his his prayer he he turned and then did the priestly blessing towards the the buffet table at the public table and i go yeah well of course like he's you know we would we would as lay people we would pray you know god thank you for this food let's do our bodies like give us strength give us a good a good meal here together whatever we always in our family pray for a good night's sleep as well because it's a hit or miss sometimes with young family but of course the, the you know the, the priest with the authority of christ can literally bless bless the food there too so he, i love that he you know signed the cross he prayed and then turns and actually blesses the food in the sign of the cross as well and then kind of kept praying i thought yeah yeah, bless everything, right? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's I mean, amazing. it's all under God's creation. I mean, of course, not the abominable or, you know, depreciable, but, you know, God God has made all creation, so why not give him glory and ask him to, you know, yeah. be glorified through our consumption of these things? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay, the next thing that people would, would notice, okay, if they were to come to, a, you know, a Catholic household or to a Catholic church, sign the cross, okay, and then the crucifix. Like, and, and so, you know, I, I, the tradition that I came out of, like Pentecostal church for most of my high school and early university career, we, I don't know, they were, they were so allergic to anything resembling like an idol or an icon or something that we had in our, in our church proper, we had a cross, but it was, wasn't even in the front of the church, it was kind of on the side of the church, like kind of out of the way, because even that couldn't kind of be front and center. You go to any Catholic church, right? And, and the crucifix, Jesus on the cross is yeah. often going to be front and center there, right? And that's going to be a major difference for those who are coming from non-Catholic tradition, right? Yeah. So what, what, are, what are we to understand about the crucifix versus the cross? And I guess what are we to help others understand when they see that and go, this isn't right. Christ rose, rose. he shouldn't be. On the cross still sean sure it's you know gosh there's so many ways to answer that my, my mind is immediately triggered i don't know if you remember like back in like 2011 2012 2013 those spoken word videos on youtube were like oh that guy super yeah. popular yeah and i think yeah. uh father, he was yeah. named father pontifex yes, or something yes. like that he came back with one but there was one that was really popular it was like oh, i'm not religious um what, what, what is it? I'm, uh, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious or something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and then, and then, so they, so they blew up in popularity. We had some Catholic responses to those. And then there was this one of this, this Islamic man kind of, uh, kind of tearing down all of these other spoke Christian spoken word ones. And I remember, I don't remember much of it, but he made one line. He said, uh, you know, using the, using the cross to glorify your, your, your sacrifice Lord is like, you know, glorifying the the murder weapon that was used to kill your mother, and I'm like, okay. I mean, you're you're really <laughs> missing it because the the cross is is more than just like the murder weapon. I mean, whenever we look at it, and and you can read this in the works of like Josephus, um, who's a very popular early Jewish writer um, who corroborates a lot of Christian testimony. And one of the things that he does is he talks about how um, the feast of the pa the Paschal feast, which is the Pascha is, of course, a, a lamb. So it's that Paschal sacrifice that was made at the Passover um, that, that was actually skewered and roasted. And it was, we can read in his works that it was actually skewered through the spine, he says, and then it was crossed at the shoulders through the arms to actually, now I had surgery on my shoulder, so I got to be careful. My wife's going to be mad when she watches this, <laughs> but it actually lays out the lamb as a cruciform. And that's how they roasted the Paschal sacrifice for, you know, 1500 years, um, 
in in a, in observation of those uh, um, the Torah, you know how the Torah says that you're supposed to sacrifice, and that yeah, was actually yeah. the method. So we don't just look to the cross as you know the murder weapon. We look to it as the fulfillment of the the one sacrifice. You know, none of the sacrifices were ever good. You know, none of the none of the all of the sacrifices. You can read Psalm 51. It's my favorite psalm, and towards the end it says, you know, the Lord doesn't want you know, just a sacrifice. He wants a, a broken and consoled and yes, contrite yeah, heart. And then he will yeah, accept yeah, yeah. the sacrifices and, and bullocks upon the altars. And so whenever we're thinking about that, we're thinking about the cross and the crucifix is not only, and you know, we don't, of course, I've already said it, we don't see it as the murder weapon. We see it as the, the final fulfillment, God's chosen plan from all time to redeem mankind through this one tool. So of course, that image is so important. As far as the commandments are concerned, you know, they would say that, hey, look, yeah, you know, you're 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 making a an image of the divine and you know, different councils here and there. I think it was the second council of Nicaea had to address this. You know, we God commanded us in the first commandment to to not create a an idol or or a, an image of anything that is in heaven or on earth below. But and people kind of stretch that and they're like, well, you made an image of the divine. You, you made an image of Christ, you know, but, but think about that. First of all, I mean, in the old Testament, you pointed to it earlier, you know, these come through Jewish practices. So what's on the top of the mercy seat of the tabernacle, the cherubim, yeah, right? The, the wings of the angels, the highest order of the angels out, outstretched. Um, there's a story and I pointed out in here in the, in the book of Chronicles where, um, God, God asked his people, um, in the early days of Jerusalem to build a pillar with a serpent on it. And as they passed over the shadow of this pillar, they would be healed. The serpent actually represents Christ in the Old Testament. Um, and we got a number of these types of sacramental images where God commands his people to create these things. And so, yeah, the, the early church saw no issue in artistically de, uh, exporting the imagery of our faith in order to say, hey, look, it, we're being reminded of this. Um, we're not believing that he is there, you know, where is it? I'm bad at this, that he is there on the cross, but that it's a, an image of him in order to dispose us again, dispose us in order to go and sanctify ourselves through the ways that he commanded, which is the, the sacraments, man, that was a mouthful, but yeah, that was, <laughs> that's, that, that's how I see it. That's how I was explaining. <laughs> that's, that's great. No, that's a, that's a great explanation. And I think, you know, one of those things that trying to understand the, the Protestant mindset about this, right. Is one of those, those misconceptions is that we as Catholics are re-crucifying Christ at every mass, right. Re-sacrificing Christ. It wasn't good enough or something. Right. And, and I, I get that because if you, if you're at a ma if you're at mass with no kind of prior knowledge, as an evangelical Christian, as a Protestant Christian, and you hear the language of the priest talking about my sacrifice and yours, and and Lord, accept this sacrifice at my hands, and, and it, it sounds a lot like something's being re re sacrificed, right? And then you see Jesus on the crucifix, and the, I think the logical kind of Protestant conclusion many times is, look, these guys, like th he's still suffering, we're still sacrificing, this is all wrong, right? Not understanding the, the deep theology of well, what's being sacrificed we're representing you know christ to the father which he right. commanded us to do at the last supper right the priest is fulfilling that in the words that christ right christ gave us right and like you say that crucifix isn't christ still suffering or christ being re-crucified it's, it's reminding us of that right that 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 mechanism that means that that god chose to redeem us right right i i yeah, it's I, present I can for see. all ages. It's yes. present for all ages, and it yes. matches. That's why, you know, I, I'm not to. I'm not like a super trad, but my kids will, will will all go to a like a Latin mass. And one of the things I like is at the consecration, they lift the um they lift the chasuble of the priest who is yeah. presenting yeah. the host or the or the chalice. Um, after the consecration, and it's an image of like him kind of like ascending, like him kind of flying yes. is what I tell the kids, yeah. Yeah. It, because the Paschal meal is still ongoing in heaven. So yeah, we are representing it, but it's a mass for all ages. It yeah. didn't just happen in the first century, and then we're like, okay, well, they had it, and we don't get to partic participate. No, yeah. he said that this yeah. is a, you know, this is meant for all generations, and, you know, that we would have to consume his body. Well, he made this way of doing it, of course. Um, yeah. There's a lot, a lot of stuff to get into there with, you know, the, yeah. the the 40 years in the desert and the manna and whatnot, and Christ is our final manna, but yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're right on the number.
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 I, and I think like a lot of those those misconceptions would come from similar places, right? Like, yeah, to, to understand that no, we're not really crucifying Christ on the cross. That's not why he's there. Understanding that will help, I think, the evangelical understand that no in mass, we're also not re-sacrificing Christ. These are very similar reasons as to why we're showing him on the cross as to what's happening in mass. And there's the, a, a deep connection there, right? Because we're, we're bending time and space in a way uh, yeah. in, in both those cases. I think that's, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. And it's, it, it, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's amazing. It, it, it's 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 all those things. We're just and I love the started. <laughs> yes. And I love the priest in the Latin mass flying up to heaven, right? That, that's where the yeah. bank was happening. He's, he's got to yeah. go up there. He's, he can't be here. He's, and there are actually priests. Um, I think St. Dominic was one of them. I was just reading about um, uh, a few others and butlers, you know, as they would perform their consecrations, yeah, they yeah. would actually levitate. And so yeah. that, I mean, that's a, you know, not every priest is able to, you know, be gifted for that kind of <laughs> not every, not ecstasy every priest, or participation no, yeah. in that mystery. But yeah, it's a well-represented one um, in some of those saint stories. Yeah, that's awesome. There's, so I, I want to touch on a few more things. Holy water is one of the other th things that Catholics are known for, right? Yeah. Things, things we're, we're known for. We're known for exorcisms. <laughs> we're known for crossing ourselves, known for the crucifix, and we're known for holy water, right? So what? tell us a bit, a bit about that, because I think this is, again, one of those things that it, it makes so much sense when you begin to understand it. But yeah. What, Sean, holy water? What's the so water? holy water is deep, but to get kind of straight, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I keep making these. I keep making these puns. So holy water is like a, a, a deep um, concept, but the bottom line is that it points us to our baptism. So of yeah. course, God is, you know, since the Old Testament with with Noah and the crossing of the Jordan and so forth. Even even the very first, um, even the first verse of the Bible says that God was present over the waters. Um, you have the voidless waters at that point. Um, so water reminds us and makes us mindful of our baptism. Where we entered into Christ's mystical body. Um, this is how we come into the church. It's the sacrament of initiation. And um, we, we expect holy water to, uh, to bless us, to remind us of this, to, of course, like I keep saying, to dispose us and um, move us and to keep us holy. Now, there's a misnomer here. Um, you will find no shortage on great Catholic websites out there that say, hey, holy water um, has the ability to remit venial sins. And that's not exactly true. Like, no, we pointed out at the very beginning of the podcast here, no sacramental has any sort of authoritative grace, like no efficacious grace that can do that. What any sacramental does and what holy water in particular does, just like the waters of baptism remove the effect of original sin and original sin, is that it's kind of like a hard reset <laughs> um, for a computer, you know, if our body's a computer, it's like a hard reset. Well, reminding us of that should um, dispose us, you know, the appreciation for that should dispose us um, to have contrition for our sins and to seek the sacraments as soon as possible. And that is what our church has consistently taught. And scriptures are very consistent on this, um, that that contrition for sin, I was mentioning Psalm 51 earlier, that contrition for sin alone is what forgives our sins through the, through Christ. Um, so it doesn't, just touching it doesn't, you know, kind of create that soft reset or any hard reset, but it can move you um, to have that full contrition or even the partial contrition of sin, which is the avenue for uh, forgiveness. But yeah, that's that's holy water in a nutshell. And demons are afraid of it, which is crazy. Yeah, and yeah. That, that yeah that'll, that'll, <laughs> yep, and I kind of cover a few of those in the book, but there's some saints who have some really wild stories of, yeah. you know, the temptress is coming to them, St. Philip Neri in the middle of the night, you know, discuss, disguised as devil or disguised as a pretty woman and they'll throw holy water on yeah. it and they'll change <laughs> yes. form or something. And there's some wild stories out there. Oh, but, I love it. Yep. Yeah, I love it. And that always, th th those kind of weird things, right, as a non-Catholic Christian, always like, well, Why? Like what, what's going on here that makes makes demons afraid of these Catholic things, right? And that really was one of those weird things that kind of piqued my interest to begin to look into the Catholic faith. There's these weird things they do that actually, you know, seem to have effect on, on, on like demons. Like they must be doing something right over there in the Catholic Church. There's something funny to point out too, Keith, without getting too astray, is we kind of keep talking about like pagans and then our separated brothers, brothers and sisters, Protestants. You know, it's it's a kind of a shame that Protestants will come and see holy water and be like, that is so superstitious. But 
really up until uh, up until like i mean the catholic church had a connection with just about every other religion out there yeah, because yeah, every yeah. other religion um from east to west values water as a as a kind of a a sacred sign yeah, you know yeah, it can yeah. it can hydrate it can lubricate it can clean it can heal um, a clean water, I mean, it was rare. So, you know, so for us to use this in a, a sacramental and religious way was observable and very familiar to a lot of uh, pagan cultures and, and religions out there. And it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird uh, dichotomy that, you know, our separated brothers and sisters kind of are a little bit afraid of it because the people who should be kind of being like, what on earth is this, who aren't Christian, they get it. Um, yeah. so yeah that's, kinda yeah that's really boat. interesting yeah <laughs> that's really interesting wow yeah okay I want to touch on two more things before we have to have to go the first is like medallions medals um maybe actually uh, scapulars because those are really interesting and look very weird for non-catholic Christians and yeah. then I want I want I want to just talk about kind of sacramental devotions and maybe just pick like one that you think is like the the coolest one to, to talk about but let's do maybe uh, I don't know medallions or or scapulars because these again are those things that many times many times right the non-catholic christian looks at a, a catholic with a, a weird medal or like wearing something strange right that one of the tropes that you often hear is oh well, the catholic believes that having this and i've heard this from sometimes well-meaning catholics sometimes people who are a bit more on the superstitious side like oh yeah having this medal in my in my pocket means i go to heaven automatically when i die yeah. right which which seems like a big red flag for the non-catholic christian who goes like really like you just all you gotta do is carry a medal around and you automatically you're saved like just bing when you die that seems kind of a little bit sketchy when i read my bible and and, and look at what it actually says yeah then you right? want to talk about ex opere operato with them no yeah um uh, well i'll try i can try to cover both but let's start with the medallions so medallions these are one of the earliest christian practices and what what actually early Christians would do kind of similar to, to their pagan brothers, well, pagan, pagan brothers and sisters to their, to their, you know, pagan, pagan counterparts is they would carry around, like if there was a, a you know, a, an old coin with the previous emperor's face on it, you'd have to get it restruck. Um, so what they would do is they would not get it restruck. They would have it restamped with like the image of a saint. One of the earliest of, of these forms was St. Christopher, or they would have like a metal, they would have the, an image of the holy face of Christ on it. And these would be carried around um, you know, by these converts who were previously carrying around, you know, either the image of the emperor, yeah, you know, they yeah, wouldn't just yeah. spend their money. They would actually use it as kind of like a charm, um, in order to say like, Hey, this is a living God. Um, and I am, you know, assenting to his power. Well, after they converted, they didn't really want to let go of that. And there's no real problem with baptizing that. So they would say, well, here's the image of our God. And I am assenting to his ultimate yeah, authority over yeah, all mankind. Yeah. Um, and they kind of grew from there. Um, and they, they were, you know, some some of them were stamped in wax. We call those on you stay. Uh, they would con contain an image of uh, a lamb, uh, like a Paschal lamb, and that's covered in the book. It's pretty rare, um, you know, not just because they're uh, stamped in stamped in wax and that kind of breaks, but um, the practice has kind of been um, relegated only to popes, which is kind of cool, but makes them rare. Um, that's kind of a brief history of medals. Um, the book covers them, and like over the course of like fifteen, really very copiously um, uh, peppered pages with a lot of facts. <laughs> yeah. um, but so there's a lot to say there, but then, uh, then scapulars, so scapulars. Yeah. So early monks, you know, who would be laboring in the fields, um, they would want to uh, dress in the, um, you know, the, 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 the regalia that would uh, be common to the worker. Well, as soon as that those uh, those regalia and those vestments changed, you know, workers in the field would not just go to a toga or some sort of overthrow. They would go to like you know pants and a shirt. Um, these religious, they kind of they were a little bit poor. They were a little bit left behind in that fashion. They would keep it, and so it became actually synonymous with the monks in the field. You know, the who would go to the monastery at the end of the day, they would keep wearing this you know, in order to kind of keep the tradition of yesteryear alive. And sooner or later, it became only them who were wearing it. And so the scapular was rem uh, a remnant of that. And it was just basically an overthrow. It contained like a little circlet for the head to go through, and it would go over the shoulders. And that those bones are called the scapula, right? And so that's where we get scapular from. It goes from over the shoulder. And this comes from the rule of St. Benedict very uh, prosperously for, for most monks. You know, he's the father of Western monasticism. So they would kind of borrow from his rule or observe his rule. And what he says in his rule is, is that the monks should wear them um, 
you know, to resemble the work that they are doing for the Lord. So other religious orders, I'm a lay Dominican, we have kind of a smaller scapular. Um, if we wear that, or even the Carmelites have the brown scapular, you know, it's like a full scapular that goes all the way down to your ankles. But even the lay people have been invested with this privilege in order to um, show the work that they're doing within the order. So um, there, I hope that I kind of kind of hit that well, I know we're kind of getting close to the time here, but yeah, that's the history and the meaning of scapular. Um, and there's, oh my gosh, I thought that there was like the white scapular and maybe the black scapular that a Benedictine would wear and then the brown scapular. I had to cover at least like eight or nine or 10. And this is like, I had to run out of kind of the word count here on scapulars, but basically every, almost every religious order adopted a type of scapular so we we tried to cover a lot of the ones that might be interesting to the layperson <laughs> yeah and there, it's such a fascinating strange thing and again these things can look strangely superstitious to those who are on the outside who don't quite understand it but it comes from it, it's rooted in, in devotion right in in wanting to draw closer to god not necessarily wanting to cheat the system and like get to heaven when you get hit by a car wearing your scapular right right yeah and it's particular with the brown scapular and i mean it's it's printed right on there you know saint simon stock was presented the brown scapular by the blessed virgin mary and like the er, the mid 1300s and it, you know it's popular piety to say that hey you know those who wear this scapular this is the coming from the words of our lady herself is those who die wearing the scapular be you know have no delay in being entered into heaven well that's like a guarantee that's kind of hard to make right you don't just get it from wearing it <laughs> What the Sabbatine privilege is, that's what it's called, that the Sabbatine privilege means is that if you wear this and you're fully invested in it, it's called an investiture ceremony, then you're going to observe certain qualities of life, you know, certain activities like the re recitation of the daily office, the, um, the prayer to the rosary, the, you know, frequent confession, and then daily mass. Um, those, of course, I mean, are going to lead you to sanctification. Yes, yeah, so yeah, yeah. in a way, you can say that if you're fully invested in observing the devotion that goes along along with the brown scapular that, yeah. yeah, you've got a pretty good chance of enduring your final perseverance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes total sense. And I think, like, I mean, a lot of these things come from, have come from a place where you have to set them in context. I remember hearing a lecture by David Anders, Dr. David Anders, another amazing convert to the Catholic faith, about what happened with the tradition of, say, medals at the Reformation, right? These, these, these Christians who'd been used to pinning medals to themselves and carrying medals around, like, like this was a, this is a popular tradition to draw them closer to, to God, to help them to, you know, to, to, to think about their faith and, and, and reflect on that, right? At the Reformation, these confused Christians who, the Catholics, who became Protestant, then actually began to pin like Bible verses to themselves and carry slips of paper with, with the words of the Bible on it in their pockets, because that was, okay, we can't, carry around medals anymore because we don't believe that we can, you know, that that's too superstitious or whatever. That's a Catholic thing. We're Protestants now. We can carry around Bible verses. And it was a very similar thing that they were doing, right? Just with the, the literal word of God instead of with, with pictures of, of saints we can pray to. It comes from the same place, right? The, that, the exact same place of wanting to draw closer to God in that, in that tradition where you, where you come from, right? So, yeah. I think like framing it like that in in both those cases is like helpful I think to understand like look we're both doing the same thing just from our own kind of tradition right, right. It's like that that whole thing we said like 30 minutes ago, I'm religious but not or I'm spiritual yeah, but not religious yeah, like yeah. mankind has this itch to behave a certain way with our convictions, especially with those of the spiritual matter. And if we believe that God created the world around us, then, I mean, there's almost nothing we can't baptize in order to give him glory. So, you know, whether yeah. it's a candle or a Bible verse or pinning to ourselves or a medal or a scapular, you know, or these on use day or a crucifix you want to wear on your neck, you know, there, there's not to, not to just say, hey, look, there's nothing wrong with it, but there are, you know, Paul would say, you know, it's written on our heart, you know, it's evidenced in the way that mankind wants to, yes. you know, genuflecting, yes. like you mentioned, you know, we, we want to show our faith somehow. And so that, of course, is emanated through the portrayal, you know, it's portrayed through the, um, you know, through the wearing or the presentation or the observance of these sacraments. It's beautiful. It's fun, yeah. you know, 
I think that was going to be one of your first questions to me early, Keith, was how'd you get into this? I'm like, well, I got into it because it's fun. Yeah. Because this is what we're all itching to do is to show that just to, not to tell everybody we're Catholic. You don't even have to do that. You can put it under your shirt and be secret about it. Yeah. But just to just to know it, you know, yeah. and, and to live it. Yeah. And it's important to do that with with the things that, you know, consecrate and and bless us. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And we, we inherit as converts such a rich tradition of the, that goes back to the very beginning and so many ways to express and understand our faith. I mean, I said at the beginning of the interview, right, that this book is the, the book that so many of us were, were itching to get because there are so many ways of being Catholic. It's almost impossible to to know what where to draw from and what to and where to go because there's just so many different means of doing that. I love that you could have presented all here for us to kind of go, okay, here are all my options. Like, what should I explore, you know, more, more deeply from here? Right. I, I think it's amazing. I want to in like 30 seconds. Well, we, don't, we, could, we can go longer than that, but I'm curious for one, one final question for you is because the last part of this book is talking about devotional practices, right? And this is again, like, you know, you have signs of the cross, you have holy water, you have all these different kinds of things we talked about. And then there are actual like real practices that you can get into like the rosary, divine office, the, uh, the, the um, divine mercy chapel, like all these, these rich kind of prayer practices, rich ways of orienting our lives towards growing deeper in Christ. I, I've done different one different um, different devotions, different times of my life that fit better or, or, or worse at different times. There's so much in there that you can do yeah. to help you deepen your relationship with Christ. As a Catholic, I don't know to ask you your favorite one or one you'd recommend people just try if they're curious uh yeah. I, I know i know the uh, a favorite challenge of mine for like the non-catholic christian we'll just pray the rosary just try it like see yeah. what, you know understand what it means do some research buy this book and, re and read what you say about the rosary and then try it like there's yeah but there's there's i don't know there's there's so many different different ways you can answer this question i'm making it hard for you to just pick no one. no but. um i am a lay dominican i would immediately go to the rosary but um the one that i would recommend it to any type of christian even new catholic or old catholic out there is the stations of the cross you know this is really like <sighs> the prefunctory this this is the the very first devotion if there ever was one jesus said take up your cross and from the earliest times of his you know life and resurrection they wanted to retrace his steps and literally carry crosses to follow you know everything from the praetorium where he was condemned all the way up to golgotha where he was crucified and to his tomb where he rose again and um, you know, the, the, so, so the stations of the cross, of course, 14 stations that depict his final suffering. Um, but also, you know, there's deep and wonderful reflections that you can have about the life of Christ um, within those two. So um, that's what he commanded us to do. It's very easy to make. Um, the stations are, you know, there's the scriptural ones, there's the traditional ones. Um, there's even the stations of the resurrection, which the, the church has uh, acknowledged and blessed off on. Um, this is like the the prima, you know. This is the this is the, the highest type of devotion that we can do in order to follow our, our Lord, even if we can't be martyrs. You know, then that was really where this all came from. Is not everybody could go to the Holy Land and be martyred for being yeah, a Christian, yeah, yeah. you know. So we had to find a way to kind of carry our cross and to follow Him and His suffering. Um, that's what this is all about. So, and it doesn't have to just be done during Lent. It can be done on all Fridays throughout the year, other than probably not on uh, Easter Friday because it's going to be a solemnity and you don't want to be doing the sorrowful or something like that. Um, but can be done through throughout the whole year. Um, and there's a uh, there's an indulgence that is attached to the pious devotion to the Stations of the Cross too. So why not? Like I said, hard reset. Why not go get that plenary indulgence? You can read all about those indulgences yeah. in the book too. <laughs> that's but, a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Stations of the Cross, man. I could not. Oh, could, I could go awesome. on and on yeah, about it. I'd probably do in the yeah, book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, it's fantastic. That's an awesome, good answer. Good answer. Uh, Sean, this has been an awesome pleasure to have you. I didn't ghost me this time, so thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for, you know, it, it, the, the good book last time. I read it, and I'm like, oh, great, have on the show. Never ended it. So, so I enjoy. I'm going to be your co-host now. It's yeah, going to be so often on here. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, well, that, that's that's great. Yeah, makes my job easier. So, sure, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Um, where do you want to point people towards to find and follow you? I uh, get this book and follow your stuff. You've 
you got a lot out there. So wh where should they go to, to find it? What do you want to yeah, do? Yeah, for this book, just go to tanbooks.com or go to Amazon or really anywhere books are sold. I always tell people, go to your Catholic bookstore. You know, those are yes. the yes. small businesses. They support Catholic families and the community. So go there. Um, of course, if you want to look into anything that I do, you don't have to, but um, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram doing funny stuff or you know, religious <laughs> stuff on there too, or just my website, seanmcafee.com, or you can keep up with me liberally there. Or, you know, epicpew.com is where uh, where my bread and butter is just making making wholesome Catholic stuff for people to live their life a little bit better. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I think I may have an article or two on there from like way back when you first launched. I think I remember you were launching that website. And, yeah. And, and I and I think I may have written something really terrible for you a couple of times. So. I'm going to look it up. You that can was, share it. We can share it along was, with us. When that we was get there. awesome. I'm sure, I'm sure it's really awful and embarrassing. I began writing as a Catholic before I was even Catholic, which is hilarious. I, I began blogging in the Catholic blog. And I wasn't even, I was a very Same. eager, eager Same. convert. So Same. that's awesome. Sean, awesome to, uh, to talk to you. It's been a great episode. Thanks for being here. I want to say, God bless you, your family, and the work you're doing for the church. And thanks so much for joining us this week. Thanks, Keith.